So first we need to download some data from the Bank of England website. So let me get that one up first. We want two interest rates, the official bank rate and the one month LIBOR rate. I'm not going to talk a lot about, well, as I go, I may talk a little bit about this. So firstly, we have to find out where the data are. There are possibly several routes to there. I guess if we go to statistics, we may uh, get their financial interest rate and exchange rate data. Uh, wholesale interest and discount rate. Here we go, the official bank rate. The official bank rate, and I gave you an identifier I U M A B E D R I U M A B E D R. It's this one. I U M A annual average end of month R-U-M-A-B-E-D-R here the monthly average of the official bank rate let's firstly get this uh, tick this show data and we download into a spreadsheet yep. open this Yes, here. Okay, so here we have our data. Let me first save this. I'll save it on the desktop for the time being. Exercise 3 data. Okay, so now we need the second data file. So the bank rate, actually, we can already. Uh, Look at this. This rate from somewhere in '87. Let's just have a quick, a quick line graph of the data. It's always good to as early as possible look at the data. You can see this goes sort of in steps, and this is actually the the rate at which the uh, central bank uh, borrows money, uh, lends money to banks. Okay. Uh, on very short notices. There's a very formal specification, but it's basically the monetary policy rate. Okay, This is the rate that's being manipulated by the Bank of England if they change their monetary policy stance. And you see the very end since 2009, this has been extremely low at half a percentage point. Let's delete that graph again. All right, so now we need the uh, second rate which one was that? That was the one month LIBOR rate. It's possibly if you already have the identifier, it may be easiest to just search for that. Let's see how that works. I U M A V N E A. Um, I U M a, B, N, E, A. Now here we go, that didn't work. So let me see if I was searching for LIBOR works. Bank of England statistics. Uh, not exactly what I was looking for. So it's uh, unfortunately the case that when you're looking for data, sometimes that is a little bit of a tedious exercise. But I, I did want to make sure you um, you see exactly that. I was hoping it wouldn't take too long. So let me search the statistical database. Perhaps I hadn't searched in the right spot. I U M A V N E A. Let's see. Yeah, that looks better. Okay. The monthly average sterling interbank lending rate. That is fine. That's exactly what we want. 
now what's called the LIBOR rate. This is basically the interest rate at which banks lend money to each other. Okay, so um, and we'll see the relationship between the two in uh, in a very short while. So we should be getting the new spreadsheet imminently. Here it is. Okay, uh, interbank rate. So now we have two Excel spreadsheets here. Let's put them all together into one file. So we have the library right here starts January 78. This goes back further. But what we're going to do is we're going to copy these data from January 78. Copy them in here. And you should always, when you work with data, keep the definitions so we'll put this on the top yeah okay that's one extra line we'll put an extra line in here so that is the definition so we can always see that and then really we don't need the data from 75 to 78 so we can delete all these ah, okay it doesn't like me to doesn't like me doing this I can just delete them and let's get I think I know what the problem was. Um, it's this little guy up here that is unfortunately a merged cell. So now we should perhaps be able to delete everything. Yeah. Okay. So here's our uh, here's our spreadsheet with the two rates now. It's possibly easiest from now on to actually transfer that to eViews and import them to eViews. We have monthly data so we can use the dated version. That I have actually done already and I'm going to close this here now. I'll just save this. Um, and I will go to eViews. Okay, so the next step I assume you can import data into eViews. I can close all this, that's fine, and I have to actually do that via remote desktop to my office. So here's eViews, and here I uploaded, I uploaded the uh, data file. We have two series, the base rate, let's just look at this again. Okay, that's the base rate. Oh, actually I have already uh, changed my sample. Mm -hmm. I'll explain that command in a minute. Let's look at the base rate. Here's our entire series of the base rate from 78 January to 2012 March. And you can see that episode of very low base rates at the very end. And the LIBOR rate, let's look at this as well. The line. Here we go. Okay, basically it shows the same pattern. Actually at this stage we possibly want to look at them both together already a line graph so in what you can see here for starters is that these two follow each other, each other very very closely okay? extremely closely they follow each other actually by the way we have done uh, uh, the first job already uh, because the first job was plot a time series graph for the two series okay we've done that uh, here so you see they follow, follow each other uh, very closely. What we're now going to do is we're going to concentrate at the period after 2000 or from January 2001 onwards up to 2000, October 2008, not the very last one. Okay. Basically this is now when the recession kicked in and we get very low rates. I want to basically include this little period, we'll talk about this a, bit, a little bit more, that's the financial crisis. 
but not the recession yet, okay, before the recession kicks in. And um, so we stop October 2008. Oh, actually, we asked, part A asked us to plot the series for that period. So here's the next important EBS command. We want to restrict our analysis to a certain sample period. We do is SMPL. Now we type in what our first period is 2001 colon 1, that's January, up to 2008 colon 10, that's October. And you can see the graph is now restricted to, to that period. So now you can a little bit better already see that somehow this period of the financial crisis, basically from uh, 2007 onwards, just to, to remind your memory, in September 2007, Northern Rock had to go to the Bank of England and get um, basically emergency loans or from the government. Actually, I can't quite remember from whom exactly they got it. And in September 2008, uh, so that's a little bit later here, uh, what happened there? Well, Lehman Brothers went bust. And we can see that th these events caused some change in the relationship between these two rates, whereas beforehand the rates were extremely close to each other, the two of them diverged. And that's what we want to investigate. So, let's see what the next task is. That's not what I wanted. Yeah, next task, B. So this uh, this guy we've done. Okay, we looked at the graph for the same sample estimate of regression with the Lieber rate as the dependent variable and the base rate as the explanatory variable, and test whether the constant is significantly different from zero. So let's go back. Delete the group. Yes, we want a regression with LIBOR as the dependent and base as the explanatory variable. I'll just put the C here and we run this. So basically this is the result for our regression. Let's see. Oh, actually I never tried that. Well, I can um, copy that across. No, I don't think so. Ah, because that's on the remote desktop. Anyway, okay, so we have to we have to look at it like this. So here is our here's our regression. And what we can see is that the coefficient, the slope coefficient, actually like this. I'll write this down. I'll just move this out for a minute. I'll write down the um, I shall write down the relationship. So we have LIBOR, let's call it LT is equal to a constant plus a slope times the base rate BT plus an error term, let's call it epsilon T and the coefficients were negative 0.5169, negative 0.5169, oh, and 1.1291, 1.1291 times the base rate. So here's our estimated Regression. So the question is now test whether the constant, let's call this alpha naught and let's call this alpha one, is equal to zero. So h naught alpha naught equal to zero, h a alpha naught unequal to zero. So basically, what we are asking here does is does the Lieber rate have a a permanent sort of markup onto the base rate. 
that's possibly easiest understood if we look at a at the graph again of the two variables okay we we basically decided before that more or less this Libra rate, the blue one, is you know just around the base rate, sometimes below, sometimes above. So basically up to 2006, I'd say there's possibly no permanent markup. However, afterwards it seems as if the Libra rate's always larger than the base rate. What does that mean? Now the, the Libra rate is the rate at which banks lend money to each other, but it's only banks usually banks would decide that you know uh, NatWest would decide Royal Bank of Scotland's pretty damn credit worthy they surely gonna pay the money back so it was basically virtually riskless and therefore they could afford to lend the money at the base rate however from 2007 onwards it seems to be as if banks are not willing to lend money at that base rate they are demanding a markup meaning that they actually consider their fellow big banks as a potentially risky investment they could go bust and we know that you know that was a real possibility that is most likely what made for this change here so so we want to know whether this uh, markup is equal to zero now you know it's a this is a a, a t-test We'll, we'll use a certain alpha, let's use alpha, are we told which alpha to use? No, so let's use alpha of 5%. So we know we want to calculate a t-test, which will be our estimated coefficient 5169 minus the hypothesized value, which is going to be 0, divided by the standard error. But now, hang on we need to know which standard error to use and after the heteroscedasticity in the autocorrelation section you should know hmm first we need to know is there autocorrelation and or heteroscedasticity in these data so what we want to do is before we complete this test we want to test for autocorrelation so what we're going to do let me write this down here first um, Fred we'll do a little note here on the side okay so we're going to test for autocorrelation and we have monthly data so let's use a lag of 12 that means we get our estimated residuals we get them from here Oh, actually, I forgot here. Possibly you're screaming already. Uh, if you have the estimated coefficients, we uh, have estimated values here. Or oh, let's do it. No, we'll do it better. If you have the actual values on the left hand side, we have the estimated residuals on the right hand side. Okay, so we get these guys from estimating our model and then we want to run an auxiliary regression of what? epsilon t hat equals a constant plus all explanatory variables so let's call it beta 1 uh, gamma 1 times beta t plus and now we get the uh, the lag term so now give them new parameters delta 1 times epsilon t minus 1 hat plus delta 2 epsilon t minus 2 hat plus a whole lot of these terms the last one as we are using a lag of 12 is going to be delta 12 epsilon t minus 12 t minus 12 hat plus a new error term so we estimate this and we will want to get the r squared from this and then we calculate the test statistic chi squared n times r squared where the r squared is from this auxiliary regression 
this will be chi squared distributed with 12 degrees of freedom and then we reject H naught which means no articulation so H naught is equivalent to no articulation if our test statistic is larger than the critical value okay we could get that from a table so we of course want to do this in eViews so we go to view residual tests here we go serial correlation LM test which is exactly the test I just described we want 12 lags and here we go here is our auxiliary regression constant base rate 12 lags we have an R squared 0 0.0655 and we have observation times R squared 61.59 and we get a p-value and that is virtually zero okay so we can also decide so we could as an alternative we could say or reject H naught if p-val is smaller than alpha let's say 0 0.05 so here in our case as our p-value is zero we will reject h naught and therefore we conclude there is autocorrelation okay and as you can see there is actually quite a lot of autocorrelation the r squared 66 percent basically we can explain 66 percent of the variation in the error terms by past error terms so this is this is an enormous amount so you know that if we have autocorrelation you shouldn't use let's go back to the regression output these standard errors here are not the ones which we should use what we should use are the new west standard errors so let's go to estimate to options heteroscedastistic consistent variance covariance matrix new vest okay so what we now get so you see what you will see is this coefficient hasn't changed but we have a new standard error now the standard error is 0 0.2411 so that is 0 0.2411 okay and that is the new vest standard error for alpha naught so our t-test is, and of course we can uh, see that here because it's been calculated, negative 2144. Yes, negative 2.144. Now we know that if we have an alpha of 5%, we know the critical value is plus minus 1.96. So we'll have reject h naught if the absolute value of the t-test is larger than 1.96 we have a two-sided test here and therefore we reject h naught that means looking at the results as they are there's a positive markup in the interbank rate in in the interbank market so looking over the whole sample period, it appears as if banks require an additional sort of risk premium for landing to each other. Looking at the graph, of course, let us go back to, to this one, we know that this may very well be a temporary situation only. In other words, we may have, or this result may be due to a structural change. And this is what we are going to investigate now. So that therefore leads us to the next task. Let's see. Let's move 
turn it on. Test whether there is a structural change after September 2007, the month, the month in, that was the month when Northern Rock uh, was in trouble. So what we first need to do is we, and perhaps actually it's worthwhile to look at D already. We'll just look at it here and then investigate in which sense the relationship between mm. the base mm. rate and the Libra rate changed. Um, so, what we remember what we said is that we can perform a chow test for part C, but we'll be unable to really investigate whether it's the, the intercept or the slope that changes. So, what we're going to do is we're going to create a dummy variable. We use the dummy variable approach and uh, that means I want to create a dummy variable dt that takes the value 0 for all t up to 2007-9, that's September, and 1 for t from 2007 October onwards. And then once we have that t, what we're going to regress is a model with our LIBOR rate as the dependent variable. We will still have the base rate as an explanatory variable and a constant, let me indicate that with a, with a 1. But we will now also include dt, our dummy variable, and bt times the dummy variable as an explanatory variable. So let's give all of these guys coefficients. They have to be different, so they're not alphas, and I'll call them betas. So beta naught times 1. So that's just our traditional constant, beta 1 times bt plus beta 2 times the dummy variable plus beta 3 times bt times dt. Okay, so we have a regression with four explanatory variables, a constant, bt, dt, and bt times dt. Now what we now need to do is we need to create dt in eViews. Okay, and that's uh, what I'm going to do now. Go back to eViews. So, firstly, uh, remember we are still working. You can see that when you just look at the workspace. We are still working our sample 2001 to 2008. Let me firstly just revert the sample to all observations. You do that by the command SMPL and then they add and then all. Okay, and you can see here that the sample has now reverted to the full set. The first thing is you create a new variable. Let's call it D for dummy variable and we'll set it to zero everywhere. Okay, we'll just say D equals to zero. Uh, Yeah, that's it. I wasn't allowed to to call it D. So uh, I know why, because D is the difference operator. So uh, there's some restricted names. So I called it series dumb equals zero. Okay, so this is now a new series, takes the value zero everywhere. And now I need to set it to one, however. I need to set it to one from 2007 October onwards. So what I now do is I'll restrict our sample to 2007 October to the last observation which is 2012 uh, March column 3. So the sample you see is restricted to this and now I'll just set 
our variable dumb equal to one. Okay, and you can do that just up here. You press enter, and now we can look at the dummy variable. And if we go far enough down, here you can see in 2007 it changes from zeros to ones. Okay, yes, our first one in October 2007. So this is great. Let me go back to the full sample because what we now do is we will estimate the revised model. Oh no, sorry, for our model we want the sample period 2001 January to 2010. We had that up here. You can go back to that command, put your cursor in and just press enter and it will reapply this command. And lastly, because I know what we need to do, let me also save the sum of squared residual of our initial regression. That was 4.3787. Let me just go back. Four point. Here the RSS was 4.3787. Is that right? 4.3787, yeah. All right, so now we will estimate this extended model. We have created our dummy series. So we'll just need to go to our equation. We'll go to estimate again. So we have constant times base. Now we also have dummy and we have base times dummy. You actually don't need to generate base times dummy. You can just um, do that here in the equation window. And we'll press OK. And here's our, here's our new model. Let me firstly just write the coefficients down. No, we don't need to write the coefficients down. Let's go back. What we are asked was to estimate a to estimate whether there is a structural break. Now, in this model, if there is no structural break, what coefficient restrictions will we have? In that case, we will have that beta 2 and beta 3 will be equal to 0. Beta 2 will equal to beta 3 will equal to 0. The alternative beta 2 and or beta 3 unequal to 0. And that will indicate that there is a structural break. How do we test this hypothesis? Multiple hypotheses. F test, quite clear. I can do that quickly. Uh, the F test, and that's calculated as RSSR minus RSSU divided by K, which is the number of restrictions, divided by RSSU divided by, I'll just call it D for the time being. This is K is the number of restrictions tested and D this is the number of decrees of freedom in the unrestricted model. So here how many restrictions do we test? Two. What's the decrease of freedom in the unrestricted model? We'll have to see how many observations have we got. Uh, we'll go back we have 94 observations. And how many parameters do we estimate? 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's 94 minus 4. We have 90 degrees of freedom. Therefore, under the null hypothesis, F test is F distributed with 2 and 90 degrees of freedom. The decision rule is reject h naught if f is larger than the critical value. So 
So let me see what the critical value is. I have a file with tables here. These are the tables from your final exam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have health distribution. Let's say we use alpha of 5. We said 2 and 90 degrees of freedom. That means the critical value is 3.10. So that critical value is 3.10. That is for 2 and 90 degrees of freedom. So now we just need to um, calculate the F test. We have the restricted RSS that was 4.3787. So we'll calculate F equals 4. I forgot already 3787. 3787 minus the unrestricted RSS divided by 2 and here divided by 90. So now we just need the unrestricted and well we get that from here. And we have 2 2.2308 2.2308 2.2308 uh, let us just calculate that or just use one of these Excel spreadsheets as a calculator. So we have the restricted is 4.3787, yeah, unrestricted 2.2308, and then the F test is. That one minus that one divided by two divided by that one divided by ninety. And what we get is forty three point three three equals forty three point three three. That is clearly larger than our critical value, therefore we reject H0, there is a structural break. Okay, so that was basically part C of the question. Now, part D is going to be quite brief. Investigate in which sense the relationship between the base rate and Libra rate change. Can you find an explanation for this change? So let's go back here. And uh, so let's look at the two variables with the dummy variable. So we have this dummy variable and the base dummy. Okay, both of them are estimated possibly fairly significant. But now, you know, to estimate the significance, we need to know is there autocorrelation. So we'll do an autocorrelation check again. I will not not write all of this down. We'll just go through it here. Residual test, zero correlation, or we'll do 12 again. So you see there is still serial correlation. Okay, there are still, there's still autocorrelation in the in the error terms. So when we estimate this model, we should really use new best standard errors. Ah, that we have new best standard errors already actually. They were still ticked from the previous one. So we can see that both of these terms dummy variable and the slope coefficient have significant terms. Let us write down the two specifications. In fact, I'll just quickly pause and I'll come back with the, uh, with the new specification. You don't have to see how I write everything. So we are here. So here we got the uh, estimated relationship. I just copied all the estimated coefficients across, and really we are now talking about part D of the question. What we can now do is we can basically write down the specification for times pre. October 2007 and post October 2007.
October 2007, which is where our break point is. For pre-2007, let's make that red, these guys here, remember the definition of the dummy variable, will be zero. So that means that this term and this term will just fall away. In that case, our predicted value for the LIBOR rate is going to be a negative 0 0.31 plus 1 0.073 and now let's have a quick look at the at the coefficients you see there is a sort of a firstly you see this coefficient to the base rate very close to one and then we have a coefficient here but to be able to tell whether that's significantly different from zero we of course need to look at the standard errors and here they go, so the coefficient is negative 0 0.31, the standard error, these are new based again, now 0.25 about, so this is clearly not significantly different from zero. So, and the base rate, the coefficient 1.07, standard error is 0 0.05, that means this coefficient, if you were to calculate a t-test to test whether this value is equal to 1, you would find that you could not reject the null hypothesis that this value is equal to 1. So really what we have here is that the LIBOR rate is equal to the base rate plus then an error term. What about post-2007? What we now know is that dummy variable will take a value of 1. That means this guy here is equal to 1, this guy is equal to 1, so what we get is LT hat is equal to negative 0.31 and then this guy here will be 3.633 times 1, so that's sort of a second component of the constant, so I'll put that here, and then we have plus 1.0 seven three bt and here this term here this entire term will also be bt okay o point negative o point six two one times one times bt so that's negative o point six two one times bt so we can now sort of collate these terms together this one will basically be three point three to 3 and then plus 1.073 minus 0 0.621 plus, oh, let's see where my arithmetic leads me to, so that is 2, 5, 0 0.452 times Bt. And let's see where these terms, so clearly this now looks very, very different to 1, this is very different to 0, and these two terms are both, so the, the constant itself, the dummy variable, coefficient to the dummy variable, is a p-value of almost 1%, not quite 1%, they were 1, 1 of 2.5%, so at a 5% level these are certainly both significant. And we tested above that uh, here we had our F test. We know that together they are significant. We tested that null hypothesis here. So what we can see is that these two models are really, really different before and after October 2007. Certainly before there was basically no difference between the base rate and the LIBOR and LIBOR and now there are quite some differences. Of course we could see this graph here as well. Here we have it confirmed uh, econometrically. So as we discussed before the question also asked can you find an explanation for this and I discussed this before. This has mainly to do with the inside 
that banks are not a hundred percent certain investment anymore or lending money to banks you are not necessarily hundred percent certain that you're going to get it back okay uh, let's briefly to complete this we know that was the situation in the financial crisis how does that look now we also have um, the complete data let me just change the sample now to include the full sample 1203 and all I want to do is I want to look at the line graph between the two okay and you can see that now the base rate has come all down this is uh, you know, basically a very loose monetary policy and a contribution of the Bank of England to um, to fight the recession and there has been some variation in here for a time that markup came down to, to zero again but more recently in 2011 it has gone up a bit again so there's still the view that lending money to a bank is not 100% certain so I think that is enough for this tutorial